Um, as you can see, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, about Wednesday, I, uh, I came home from the office and I, I was talking to Kayla and, and I told her, I said, um, with, all, with everything going on, you know, and it was, we were being bombarded, all of us, with what was happening on television, what you read in social media, and, and the tragedies, the atrocities that were going on in Baton Rouge and Minnesota and then Dallas and throughout the different, just seeing a breakout of, uh, of just violence and anger and wrath and hatred. And, um, and I came home that afternoon and I, and I, uh, I had impressed upon my heart. I told Kayla, I said, um, I said, God's really, really dealing with me about something. She said, really? I said, yeah. I said, you know, I, I feel like that to show up Sunday and to have great praise and worship and to preach a word with three points and a closing sentence and, and to shout and go home and pretend like nothing's going on will be a great injustice. And, um, amen. And, and I, I talked to several pastor friends all over the country um, throughout this week and, and pastor friends of uh, white, black, Hispanic, I mean, just different ones we're, I'm in relationship with and we were discussing different things. We were coming together in agreement um, for different things and, uh, and just discussing some things. And, and uh, several of them um, don't have multicultural ministries. They have, you know, churches of, of usually of one race, of one culture. And as I was talking to a couple of them, I, I kind of started to get the feeling between our conversation um, that God was speaking in my heart and then he also speaking through them that we have a tremendous responsibility here at Kingdom Builders and that we have been afforded the responsibility and um, the opportunity to address some things that some ministries couldn't address um, because we are diverse. I hope you realize that what you see in here on Sunday mornings is not the norm. I know we got folks in here that this is the only church you've ever attended. You got saved in this ministry and you've been a part of this. But I want you to understand that, that this is not the norm. This is a rarity. And it's precious to us. And we have built and fought for a decade now to make sure that this was what God showed us. And, um, and, and whenever things begin to occur in society that don't match up with what God showed us, then we have conflict. Have you ever gotten a word from God on something, a promise from God, a prophecy from God, but then what you see doesn't match what God said? And I've told you before, when that happens, what are you gonna believe? Are you gonna believe what you see around you, or are you gonna believe what God said? Well, that goes the same for us as a ministry. Everybody in the world is saying this shouldn't happen, this couldn't happen, and, and that God would never allow this to happen. They, they will. I'm telling you, and I need you to hear that when I said God doesn't do this. I've heard messages this week preached by preachers saying that part of the problem is we're trying to integrate places where God didn't call us to integrate. The devil is a lie. And I hate to bust anybody's bubble, but if you think in heaven everybody's gonna look like you, you're gonna be sadly disappointed if you make it there. <laughs> so we have a responsibility. And as I begin praying into what today would look like, um, I was reminded of, of, of something from my youth. When I was growing up, we had conflict occasionally in my home. Now I know some of y'all so holy, you glow in the dark, and nobody argues in your house. And when you write a book on parenting and marriage, I'll read it. But until then, I wanna share with you my struggles. And whenever we would have issues going on in the house between me and Susanna or me and my mom or me and my dad, my dad would call a family meeting. And we would all go down to the den and my dad would sit on the edge of, the, of this fireplace and we would sit around the room and he would start and he'd say, all right, what's the problem? And he'd start and he'd go one by one and all four of us would share. And I would say things like, he'd say, why are you upset with your mom? And I'd say, well, because she's always on me and she won't never get off my back. And she's just always telling me what I don't do in this. And he would hear my side of the story. Then he would say, he would look at my mom and say, what's the problem? She'd say, well, I've told him 17 times to pick his dirty socks up off the floor and he just won't do it. And I'm still having those discussions today. It's a generational curse, hallelujah. But, <laughs> but what we would do is we would go around the room and everyone would share their perspective. And what it would do is it would make you aware of how others in the circle were feeling. And so now I realize that when 
I do a certain thing, it causes you to feel a certain way. And when you do something, it causes me to feel a certain way. But if you don't know that, you can't be sensitive to it. The biggest challenge I see right now for us in the body of Christ is the lack of sensitivity. Yeah, you ain't got to amen, but it's doggone true. And we, we are so bent on being right and correct that we have forfeited our ability to listen to what others are saying. So what I want to do right now is we have, we have put together a panel collected of people from our ministry that represent different demographics of folks. A young African-American man in his 20s who have been talked about and plastered all over the news all week long. A representation of law enforcement, a man who puts his life on the line day after day to provide security and safety for us in our community. A woman who is raising a teenage son in the midst of all this stuff by herself. A couple that when they walk into a room, people want to turn an eye to or they begin to wink at or they begin to question because their skin color is different. And on top of that, they've brought children into it. They're working on blending a family. They're blending a family two ways. A gentleman who, who served on our armed forces and also served in, 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 um, in law enforcement. And our, we know that the, all the heck that our military catches, even when they come home after serving our great country, how they're villainized and demonized. And a young man that represents the Hispanic community that has, is oftentimes a voice that is not heard when it comes to our society. I've told them they've got about three to five minutes apiece to share perspective. If you don't fall in the category that they're speaking about, you don't have any idea what it's like. And we can come in here and say we love, and we can come in here and say that we value, but the truth of the matter is if I don't understand you, I will abuse you. I need you to hear this. What you don't understand, you will abuse. If, I, if you handed me this and I've never seen one of these before and I started hammering a nail with it, I would bust it. I would abuse it. Why? Because I don't have an understanding of what it's used for. But when I have understanding, then I can understand the proper use of something. The key to the body of Christ is that we are the body of Christ. And the hand needs to know how the arm operates, and the arm needs to know how the leg operates, and the leg needs to know how the eyes operate, and it's important for us to have understanding of those that don't look like us but are called to be a part of us. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get the first half of this message is going to be sharing perspective, and then I'm going to share with you a word because we are fighting a spiritual battle. I know you think it's race. It's not race. Racism is a fruit of something that is deeper. And the problem that we have is we're trying to answer spiritual questions with earthly solutions. And we're thinking that if we can get the right person behind a desk, that it doesn't matter who's on the throne. And I want to explain to you and share with you according to the word of God today what our responsibility is and then we're going to end this thing with a prophetic word that God gave me about this particular gathering of people that is going to, you're going to leave here happy. Does that sound like a plan? Amen? Now listen, I need, I need you to catch this. this is, we're going to talk, this is unrehearsed, this is unscripted, so this is, it, it may not be all pretty all the time. I need you to hear this though. Open up your mind and open up your heart to what God is saying. And at the end of the day, if there's something in you that doesn't sit well, that is irritated, then that is the opportunity for you to seek out what God's will is according to that thing in your life. If there's something that stirs up some angst in you, then you just, all right, God, what is this? Because when I hear them say this, it stirs something up in me. And, and, and the last thing I want to say is this. In a time that we're in, the place you need to turn for information is not the media. I can read one story that tells me one thing and another story that tells me something completely different and I'll change my thinking based on what I read. Do not be, the media is not on your side. They are not to inform you, they are to program you. If you want to be programmed, don't turn to the media, turn to the word. 
And so I want to I challenge you in this time that we have together, open up your mind, open up your heart, and listen to perspective, because once we begin to become aware of each other's plights, then we can be sensitive to it, and then we can start providing solutions. Because you have things that I need, I have things that you need, but I need to know what it is you're facing so I know when to help you. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. First of all, I want to I ask, where's the microphone at over here? I'm going to give it to Jamel first. Put him on the spot. He's sitting in the middle. That's right. He got all that red on. Praise the Lord. Y'all can see him. <laughs> Jamel, I want you to share some perspective, challenges, solutions, anything you want to share on behalf of a young African-American male in our society today. I think one of the biggest things that's facing not only the black male but the black community in general is a perception of who we should be compared to where we come from. I know one of the biggest battles that I've faced is up until the age of about eight years old, I grew up in Kenston, North Carolina, on the corner of Atkins Street and Gordon Street, and that's one of the toughest places in that city to grow up. Um, you can compare it to a flower trying to go through concrete as far as the toughness that's faced, that, that you face coming out of that place. It's, it's a hell hole, and you go through hell while you're there. And one of the biggest things that I faced while I wasn't there is having a voice that poured into my life with a authoritative tone. Like my mom was, she was my guidance and she did things to protect me and to take care of me, but as mother's love isn't the same as a father's authority. And not having a father there to, to say don't do these things and give me a reason why not to do those things and to take me places and to show me things from a different perspective, it kind of put me behind the eight ball. But when we moved, I came to Wallace and I I decided that because I came from a place, that it doesn't mean that I have to be that place. Come so. on, come on. So I changed my, tried to change my perspective on life and it was difficult the younger I was, but it got easier when I got friends, friends that didn't look like me, friends that came from different backgrounds that I had, friends that had more opportunities than I had, but friends that were willing to say, you know what, I love Jamel for Jamel, not where he comes from and not what he looks like. So they invited me into their homes, they invited me into their lives, and I got to see what it's like to have two parents in the house. I got to see what it's like to sit at a table and have dinner, because that's not something that a lot of times that you see in my community, there's not a lot of togetherness. Even if there is a father in the home, a lot of times you see dad sitting in front of the TV eating dinner. I may be eating TV in my room because I got homework. There's a lot of different things of togetherness that we don't necessarily get to experience. Not good or bad, right or wrong. It's just different how I was able to grow up. But seeing those things, it kind of allowed me to be who I am today, a melting pot of the black community and the community that I got to see in my friends' homes and then the things that I got to learn from the people around me. But the biggest thing that we're facing today is that young black men don't have anybody in their lives to check them, to say, you know what, you're not doing the right thing. Pull your pants up. Cut the music down. Stop cursing. Stop saying these things. Stop doing these things. Come here. Let me show you a different way. And that's one of the things that I've kind of, like, geared my life towards. Because where I, co I coach ball, everybody knows me. I coach ball. And I coach at a place where there's a lot of kids that don't really have direction, that come from broken homes, that come from broken places, and I, I understand their struggle. Like I, they don't trust anybody. They're angry at the world. And it's, a lot of people turn their, turn their nose up at them like those are just bad kids. And it's not the bad kids. They just come from bad places and not have, they've never had a chance to, for anybody to say, you know what? I know you're hurting. I know those things are bad. And I know that while you're with me, things are good. And I got to send you back to it. But I need you to soak up the things that I'm giving you while you're here. So when you take it back, you can recall some of the things, some of the love that I give you in those broken places that kind of, to get you through it. And the biggest thing is that what, what I gotta stop doing and what the world really needs to stop doing is looking at people that come from places that are different than us and assuming that because they come from somewhere that's different, different than us, that they're different than us. Come on. Like, And this is the last thing, and I'm going to pass the microphone because I'm tired of talking. But I can't change. One of the things that kill a society is first impressions. Like, you preconceive people and you prejudge people sometimes by how they look or where they come from or how they're dressed. And while I can't change how people perceive a six foot two, 330 pound black man, 
I can't change your first conception, but I can change the conception that you have of me after that point. Right? And that's my responsibility, not to change how you think of me, but how I portray myself and how I interact with you so that the, even though you may begin feeling one way, that you end and leave with a different opinion of who I really am. Amen. Now, Amen. Now, real quick, tell someone that looks like me, someone that looks different than you, what, is there anything you would say to us to help you understand your perspective alongside what you just said? As far as you just talked about things that you need to do, but is there anything you'd like to say to us as far as be patient or, or don't be judgmental? Is there anything you'd like to say to people who, who, who look different than you? Before you write us off, give us a chance to live beyond the racial stereotypes and the things that society not only has trained us to believe about ourselves, but for you to believe about us. Before you allow those things to come into play, give us a chance to show you that we're different than everything that you've always believed. Come on. Good. Daniel and Jenny, many of you, I don't know if many of you know this, but they are actually, they have just launched a, a ministry um, that they are on the verge of, of getting started um, uh, that deals with mentorship. And Scott, it's, it's really multifaceted, um, but I, I, I want them to speak a couple things. You can, you can talk about some of that because I know a lot of the solutions that you guys are coming up to are answers to, to the issues Jamel wrote, brought up. But also talk about, you guys got a blended family. You both brought kids in the relationship. So that presents challenges. But then also being in, in the South, as we call it, and I'm so sick of the stereotype in the regions too because, I mean, that just creates more division. But being in the South, I mean, you, you, you guys come together, obviously different races. I mean, talk about the challenges that that presents as well. Well, first, just touching on kind of what Jamel was saying, that story that he said of, of how he grew up and and the environment that he grew up in, that's, that story is true for, for him and me and, you know, a lot of other African-American African males that I know, which is kind of what prompted Jenny and I to start A Harbor of Hope. Because um, I was just sitting one day, and I think I called Brad, and I was riding down 40. Uh, it's a quick story. I was riding down 40, and, you know, I heard people say how God speaks to them, and I never understood what that was like. I never knew what that felt like or what it looked like. And I called him one day and I said, man, I don't know what this is, but whatever it is, it just hit me in my chest and I feel it. I'm riding down 40. All I can do is cry. It was almost like a burden almost that I didn't even know was there. Um, I always get emotional when I talk about it just because it, it, it really does hit home a lot. Um, just to give an idea of how, how common it is, I was talking to Jenny and I named five or six of my friends and... Five of them did, grew up in their house just like I did without a father, without a male influence. And the same is true for kids today, even more so now. And it's like a growing epidemic. Um, and, you know, which is why we started A Harbor of Hope and why we're wanting to do that, just because I want to be able to go to every little kid. I know it's, this, this may be far-fetched, and I'm a bit of a dreamer, but I would want to be able to go to every little kid that does not have a father in their house who feels the way <clears throat> that I felt when I was growing up. And I just want to tell them that if nothing else, just know that I love them. You know what I mean? Because a lot of kids, and, and I didn't hear, that's something that I didn't hear growing up. It was, it was maybe when I was 18 or 19, I came to my mom and I said, you know, how come, no, you know, nobody ever tells me that. Like Jamil, I saw how other families interacted and I saw how, you know, the affection that they were shown. And I called her one day, and I was like, why, why didn't anybody ever tell me that when I was growing up? It's one of those things you don't know you're missing it until you see it somewhere else. Like, I didn't know that that's how, you know, people grew up telling you that they loved you when you got off the phone or drive safe when you get to your destination. Those aren't things that, that I was used to. But now that I'm older and I've got kids of my own, I understand that I tell them I love them. I can't even count how many times a day just so they know. You know what I mean? When they go to bed at night, if nothing else, they know that their dad loves them and that I'm always going to be there and that they're never going to have to wonder, you know, where I am or, or, or what I'm doing. Just touching on what Jamil said. But um, as far as being a blended family and an interracial family in the South, I guess, 
it's just one of those things when you when you walk in somewhere, people look at you differently. And uh, you know, if I show somebody a picture of my of my of of Jenny's family who who would be white, and I say this is my aunt, this is my aunt Angie, or this is my nana, and they kind of look at me like, well, how exactly are y'all related? <laughs> because you know, obviously I'm black and she's white, and that's just that's uh you know, and I'll show pictures of my kids, and it happens a lot at work when you know people ask questions. They want to see my family. They want to see where I come from. And um, one thing I will say is once they see my family and they see where I come from and they see my wife and they see her family and I talk about them, it's almost like they view me differently now. It's almost like they say, okay, well, we accept you now, kind of, because, because of, of my family and where I come from. Had it, you know, had my wife been... African American also maybe they still would have looked at me the same way but when I can when I can uh be on common ground with them and when they can understand that this is my wife and she is white and her family is white and I do go to family reunions where I'm the only black person there and she goes to family reunions where she You're Marcus. Or you're Marcus though, right? Yeah, Marcus, Marcus yeah, my brother in <laughs> now. Yeah, so I'm not alone anymore. It feels a little bit better, but I mean I have been I have been in those in those situations and I mean how does it make me feel? I guess Jenny doesn't ever notice it. She doesn't notice anything. She doesn't notice people looking at her. She doesn't notice like that's just not. She's just. Um, she reminds me of Kayla a lot. She's just that's flying right. in her own own little world. And she's you know. But but me on the other hand, I guess as a as a male and as trying to be protective of my family, like I'm observant of everything when we go places and I see it. Um, does it bother me? Yes and no. Just because I I mean. I don't let it bother me. You know what I mean? I don't want to. I don't want to look at one person in the way they treat me and assume that every white person or every white man or white woman or Spanish person is that way. I try to not to let one person's actions dictate how I feel about everybody. So that's just how I. That's how I kind of. Thank you. He doesn't want anybody but me, so he's anti the nursery. <laughs> um. He kind of touched on a harbor of hope, and it's crazy how I've known Dan since high school, um, and it's crazy to see how God works. You know, I truly believe that he and I were supposed to be together, and even as this continues to unfold, it just continues to reiterate, you know, what I believe was God's plan. He has this vision. This is his heart for troubled children. My passion has always been marriage and family. Um, I'm not finished with that degree, but that is my passion. And the way that that is going to continue to come together and mold together and completely operate through that um, organization for people and their children who are hurting. And um, I was reading on the way here, and it was talking about, and I just looked up, you know, the effects of fatherlessness in children's lives. And I work with kids. And to see in children's development what may be um, portrayed as behavior problems most of the time is so much deeper than their behavior. It's rooted in an anger. An anger they can't even, they don't even know that they're angry. They cannot wrap their heads around, you know, what they're feeling, why they're behaving a certain kind of way. Um, to talk to Daniel some about, you know, his experience as a kid and growing up, and, you know, he talks about it all the time about how he was such a horrible kid. Um, and, and I told him when he started telling me those things that it was just him being angry, you know, that he couldn't, that's just how children lash out. They cannot say to you, I'm angry about X, Y, and Z, you know, until they get to a certain age. Um, so that's why we want to go for the young kids, um, and be a positive influence for those young children, Amen. especially the ones that don't have dads. Amen. Thank you guys. Thank you. Aaron, um, of course, law enforcement officer and, um, and is part of our leadership here at church as well. But I want him to just share because that's the one thing. And I, some of you may have seen my, my, my post on social media um, yesterday, but I don't even know if I've talked with these guys about it. But the three of us were having, uh, we had breakfast Friday morning 
And, um, and a guy came up and, and spoke, and he was, you know, just kind of, you know, introduced himself to these guys, and we talked for a few minutes. And then I happened to run into this guy yesterday, and he just asked me, he said, now, who were the two guys you were having breakfast with? And I, I shared with him, and I was explaining who they were. They are part of our church. And, and I said, you know, and I talked about Jamel's leader of our outreach, and I'm doing basketball camp, and I talked about Aaron was a law enforcement officer. And I had not really thought about it. He stopped me and he said, he said, well, that's kind of ironic this week that you were having breakfast with a law enforcement officer and a young black male, which are the two people that the media has pitted against each other all week long. And, 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 I, and I looked at him respectfully and I said, and he said, that's kind of ironic. And I said, with all due respect, it's not ironic, it's intentional. And, 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 it, and I love the discussions that we were having and some of the things that we were talked about because if you're not willing to have the tough conversations, you'll never come, you'll never discover the tough answers. If you're not asking the right questions, you're not going to come up with the correct answers. So I've asked him to share because this week, uh, at the beginning of the week, we saw so much scrutiny placed on the men and women uh, that uphold the law that, that, and, and, and you know, just talk about everything you know, negative about it. And then we saw the tragedy that occurred in Dallas. And I just want him to speak on what it's like from a law enforcement perspective, on what it's like to get up in the morning and, and to serve people that sometimes you don't have any idea what the day holds for you. So Aaron, if you would, just share that. Yeah, so um, what I think the, when I think of law enforcement, I think the basis of is, is servanthood, is, is being there for people when they need you most. Um, when somebody calls 911 and they say, hey, look, I need some help, we in law enforcement is who goes. We are willing to, to put ourselves in tough spots, tough situations, not knowing what's going to happen. Um, when we get there, you know, on the way there, you know, your mind's going 100 miles an hour. You know, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? Long story short is you don't know what's going to happen. So when you get there, you know, you could have a, you know, something planned out in your mind, but when you get there, it could be something completely different. And you don't know what you're walking into. So the fact that, and, you know, I don't ask for, you know, praise with this in law enforcement. You can ask them. They won't either. But they're willing to... 99% of them are willing to lay down their lives just to help you out, just to get you out of a tough spot. You know, if, if one of y'all call and say, hey, look, you know, I need some help, I'm there. Regardless of what's going on, I'm there. And that is what I think law enforcement, the basis of law enforcement is, is servanthood, is laying, basically laying down our lives so that you can live. And it's just like in the military, you know, that's giving up yourself so that others may live and that others may live a, an abundant life. And that's what I think it is. You know, we, we get a misconceived concept that, you know, sometimes we just, you know, we arrest people and we take them to jail and that's it. And sometimes that's what it looks like. But truth be told is we care about people because when you realize that these are actual people that you're, you're dealing with, they're just like you. So when you go to a, to a bad call, and, and you end up taking somebody to jail, you know, somebody would just throw them in jail and be done with it and walk away. But I, I can't do that. I look and I'm like, that, that's an actual person. They have an actual heart. Right. They're just like me. I'm no better than them Come that on. they're in handcuffs. Come on. Come Everybody on. is covered. I don't see black. I don't see white. I see red. And that's the color that Jesus shed for all of us Amen. in here. Amen. And so if, if I could say, you know, one more thing, you know, I know it sounds cliche, um, but just, just pray, pray for our nation, pray for our law enforcement, pray that, you know, they're safe because I found this out that it's, it's hard to hate somebody you pray for. That's right. Come on. Amen. It's hard to hate somebody you pray for because I've known firsthand what that's like. I've held stuff in on my heart towards people that I very disliked. And, I've, and I, you know, God told me, he said, why don't you pray for him? And I was like, I ain't, I'm not going to pray for him. <laughs> but I did, and then I looked at him in a different light. Because when I started to pray for him, walls began to, to come down, and grace began to come down, and love began to come down, and then I looked at him in a different light. And so if, if you're, you're feeling resent towards somebody, and, you know, you're not really feeling them, just try praying for him. Because when you pray, I promise you, you will not be able to look at that person the same ever again. Amen. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I think that is, that is absolutely what we need to be doing.
is be prayerful for our law enforcement folks and all of our first responders and everybody who are constantly putting your life on the line. And I say on behalf of the citizens, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for law enforcement. Thank you. Um, and, and I declare that, that those of us who are seeing according to the spirit will not judge the majority according to one or two bad ones or, and even if, even, or, or one or two bad situations. Um, I hope you know that we appreciate you know, all that you guys do. So thank you for that. Omar, talk to us about what it's like to be, uh, the, as a representation of the Hispanic community that we've seen, it, especially in our region, an influx of over the last decade or two and, uh, and, and the challenges that go along with it and then maybe the perception that you would like people to see so that it could kind of shift our perspective when we think about people in the Hispanic community. I think um, being Hispanic in America today, it's a really unique position because, um, you know, although, you know, you, you, all, you have the difference in the white culture and the, you know, African-American culture, Hispanic culture is weird in the sense that we can be foreigners in our own home. You know, we can be foreigners in our own country, you know? And I think that's a unique challenge. You know, that's something nobody else has. Nobody can look at an African-American and say, you don't belong here. But you can be an American citizen born here in the United States of Hispanic parents and feel like you don't belong here. Because the things around you aren't, um, how should I say, the culture's not ready to accept the fact that even you don't know really what you are, okay? So now you have the challenge where some people are born here, you know, they speak English, so now the older generation, your parents' age, they don't accept you because you don't speak Spanish like they speak Spanish. But yet at the same sense, American culture may not accept you because you don't look like them. <clears throat> So that, that's a challenge. That's, that's always been a challenge. The reason why there are so many Hispanic people in Duplin County, I believe, is because so many people are accepting of Hispanics in Duplin County. And I thank God for that. You know, um, <clears throat> I'm, I mean, seriously, this is probably one of the places where there's least judgment as far as that's concerned. I feel in my heart, I've always felt that way. I fully identify with American culture. I fully identify with the South, you know. Um, but... I've been one of the lucky ones. You know, I got here early enough where, as you can tell, I speak English. Uh, second of all, I don't have an accent. If I speak to you over the phone, you may think it's a white man ordering that pizza, you know? I'm <laughs> so I'm lucky. You know, you don't, you, and it's easy for me to explain to you, hey, I have the same ambitions as you. I have the same desires as you. I have the same dreams as you. It's easy for me to do that, but there's some people who can't. And I think the biggest thing is going to be to have patience. You know, be patient with these people who are 40 years old, removed from their home, and we don't have the advantage of inheriting anything. I think that's one thing that, that I don't think people are sensitive about. My father was not here, was not born here. His father was not born here. His father cannot inherit anything to him. He starts from zero. I don't have heritage here. I, I can't go somewhere and my father say, this is where I played ball. You know, and that's a challenge, I think. Um, it's hard to not have an anchor in, in this country, you know, and, and for me, that's, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, it's, it's um, starting from zero, you know, I mean, you have people who leave their country, and I remember my dad telling me a story, he came here in the late 80s, and he says, I mean, you know, if you'd went to Piggly Wiggly to shop for groceries and you heard someone speak in Spanish, you'd run, you know, total strangers, you'd run over there and say, hey, where are you from? You know, how, how have you been? You know, what, what was your, what's your story, man? You know, you wanted to speak some, you wanted to, to, to be with somebody who spoke the language and, and who was like you because you felt like an outsider. And I feel like sometimes our Hispanic children today, our, our teens, they feel that same way. And man, that's got to be, that's got to be, you know, real difficult. Again, I've, I've been one of the lucky ones. I've been blessed. Another challenge we have is that within the Hispanic community, you do have so many cultures. It's not the same thing to be Mexican as it is to be Puerto Rican, as to be Honduran, as to be Cuban, as to be from El Salvador. It's, it's totally different. Each one of those situations is so different, you know? Um, so that's a challenge. You know, that requires some sensitivity. I think some people are offended when they, you know, when they automatically call you a Mexican because, you know, that implies that your culture is not valuable. You know, I myself, I am Mexican, so <laughs> again, I'm lucky there. So if you say, if you say I'm Mexican, you'll get it right, you know. But um, again, you know, just be patient. Just be patient. Be willing to listen. And again, 
You know, I thank God for Dublin County. I thank God for this part of the state. I mean, you know, there is a reason why there's so many Hispanics here. You know, but again, unfortunately, because we don't have a voice, a lot of times you get a lot of misconceptions that come up. One of the biggest ones that I hear is, first of all, contrary to, the, <laughs> to, to truth, because you know that to live in America, two things are certain. Taxes, that one day you'll pass away. But yet, you know, you have people say that illegal immigrants don't pay taxes when that would go against the first truth, is that the first thing that's, that's obvious in American society is taxes. The difference between an illegal immigrant and a U.S. citizen is that the illegal immigrant does not get any money back for his tax return. That money stays within the internal revenue system, the internal revenue service, right? So it's not that we're here, that, that illegal immigrants don't pay taxes. The only difference is that we don't get that tax back. You know, we're also consumers, you know? We walk into your stores, we walk into the, into the gas stations, and we pay taxes on our fuel, we pay taxes on our clothes. So in that way, we're helping the economy, you know what I mean? Um, so those are some misconceptions, you know, that I think are interesting. Another challenge we have is that you have a lot of people who say, well, you know, it's cool if they come here legally. What does that look like? Nobody can tell me with any sophistication what a um, comprehensive immigration reform looks like. That's way above my pay grade, I'll tell you that, but it, it's not, I don't think it's conducive to a, to a healthy conversation when you have um, mentalities like that because you couldn't tell me what that looks like. The President of the United States can't tell you what that looks like right now, you know? So it's, it's very challenging, it's very challenging. But again, you know, just, just remember, it, it, the cultures are different, but we have the same dreams, we have the same aspirations, man. We have the same desires to be productive members of society, to raise our children, you know, um, to love, to live, and uh, that's basically it. But I, I want to say this too. I, I think the perception, the prejudice perception is, is that um, illegal immigrants want to come here illegally. And that's, and that, I mean, it's almost like, I think that we have placed this idea that, oh, well, they want to come here and live illegally and steal our jobs or whatever. And that's, I mean, it's people trying to make a better lives for themselves. Sure, that's... So, um, Another thing you have to understand is that the system is broken. Why? Because you, if you're here illegally, what that means is that you feel like you have no protection from the law. Okay? You don't have the right, you, or at least that's the feeling sometimes. You're afraid of law enforcement. When you have a problem, when you're being abused at your workplace, or, or you know, if, like women, if, you're, if they're being trafficked, or children, if they're being abused, they don't feel like they can go to law enforcement and say, hey, I need help. Why? Because now you've exposed yourself to the fear of deportation. To go back somewhere where you don't know anybody, you know, and that's another thing um, I think is really interesting. You have to understand sometimes that the biggest challenge that the Hispanic community faces too is that a lot of times we don't have the support group that Americans have. You know, because a lot of times who may have come over was mom and dad and you. So they don't have uncle to leave you with. They don't have grandma to help, to help or watch you after school. You know, they don't have, you know, your uncles and, and stuff like that to, to help you. You know, you don't have that support system. So a lot of times you'll build like these little conclaves almost of communities where everybody, you know, kind of separates themselves from the outside world because you feel like you have to do that. You know what I mean? So. Well, and what I hear you saying though, for, for everybody that doesn't, that is not Hispanic is be patient. I mean, be patient and, and be sensitive. I mean, Basically. What, I mean, yeah. you know, and, and you know, um, just talk to people, man. Talk to people. I think, you know, my generation, especially, we have absolutely no issue with you asking us like, so where are you from? A lot of people tell you I'm from Keenansville, but. It's okay to dig deeper. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've got a good friend. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Kenosville. I said, where are you really from? <laughs> you know, where's your family from? You know, and that's not a problem because, um, or at least I feel like my generation, man, we're so open about it now. You know, we, we do feel comfortable, especially in this part of the country, man. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's anywhere else in the country where, where you can be so open about your, you know, your culture and, what you think and what you feel as far as, you know, Hispanics and, and you know, I thank God for that. But. Amen. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much. <laughs> Benita, speak to us about what it's like being a, a, a single parent home, raising a, at this point, a teenager, yes. um, and, uh, and he's a young African-American male at that. But speak, just speak, speak, if you would, uh, from the standpoint, from the perspective of being a single parent. Well, um... For me, I haven't always been a single parent. Um, five years into my marriage, or seven years into my marriage, I became a single parent with G being five years old. Um, the first thing you have to do, I feel even 
together or apart is giving back to God. And that's what I did at first. Um, then whenever he became, uh, we became separated and everything, I knew as a single parent that I had to be a parent first. A lot of people feel that, you know, they can be their kid's best friend or whatever, but the only way that I knew to keep him on the direct path was to be a parent. Probably not the best parent, and that's what he and I shared even just last week. I told him, I said, I believe you have a bad mom, or you probably think you got the worst mom. And he actually said to me, Mom, you're not mean. You're not, you just want me to do the correct things. So I just feel that every parent that may not have the father in the home to remember first that um, you are a parent first. Um, stop trying to be their buddies and stop trying to let them get, a, get off the hook with certain things. Their chores that need to be done, make sure that they get them done. Make sure that you have the same perspective as if there were two parents in the home because that's the role that you actually play. And talk about how um, you, you shared with me before um, the, the power of having um, positive male role models, which is what these two guys were hitting on earlier. Talk about the power of that, because you've seen that operate in exactly. G's life. So if you would just speak to that. Well, the first thing I um, always taught G, he never knew color. That was the first thing in life. Um, he didn't know an African-American person. He just thought we were all brown. You know, and that's what he would say. He said, Mama, you mean the white person or the brown person? And my, my whole perspective there was, it doesn't matter who the person is. It matters what they're trying to instill in you. And here at Kingdom Builders, I've been here for nine and a half years. This is basically our life. I've had people that come up to me and just mentor into G things that I know that I couldn't do as a female. He has a whole lot of role models here and I thank you all for that. Um, he's not the type of person that would just not listen to you and turn away from you, but anything that you have to instill in him, he will listen to you. Amen. You got a fine young man too. I hope thank you know that. You. Praise God. And last but not least, I've asked Pastor Lewis to speak on behalf of, of military. Um, I, read a, I read an article a couple of days ago that was, it blew me away talking about veterans, or people who served this country uh, in, during wartime who were struggling to get benefits. And I'm not trying to make this a political thing. What I'm trying to say, there is, I believe sometimes that becomes a forgotten people group. That we as a society because when we are during times of peace, and I know that's a relative term, but when we're not literally at, uh, in your face of war with another country, that those people can oftentimes be forgotten and the sacrifice that they gave, and the sacrifices that they made, and the sacrifices many families have given up for the freedom of this country, um, that, that oftentimes not only are those people not valued appropriately, but even sometimes they're villainized because we don't agree with the decision that was made to go to war in the first place. And so what I've asked him to do is kind of speak on behalf of people representing the military on, on, on their perspective and what we can do as a society to make sure that we not only value and embrace the sacrifices, but that we make sure that we take care of people that took care of us. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll address that first, but it's just amazing to me. Let me say this before I go walk into that part of it. Um, my whole life, I've always prayed, God, why have I had to endure the things I've endured? And right now in this very moment, I truly understand why I have gone through and experienced the things that I've experienced because now I have a perspective um, that I only could have 
from this place in my life to, to experience the things that I've experienced. I have a perception of what it feels like to be in law enforcement because I've been in law enforcement. I have a perception to, to know what it feels like to be incarcerated because I've been incarcerated. I have that perception and the ability to understand what it feels like to, to fear law enforcement, even as a white male, to when the, when the guys get behind you with the blue lights or you interact with some of them to say, oh, because you're a convicted felon and it pops up on that computer, then there's a fear that comes into you that can't be it even described unless you experience it. Um, so I, I'm truly thankful for those experiences in my life to allow me to be able to sit from the where I sit today and see it as a pastor to be able to pour into people's lives that, hey, I, I know what it feels like to, to be afraid of law enforcement. I know what it feels like to be incarcerated. I know what it feels like to be in that position of authority and to be, quote, disrespected. But also to be in a place of, from, as Pastor Brad was just saying, in the military and be forgotten, if you will. Um, the people that serve our country in the military, they don't want you to honor them. They don't want you to sing their acc accolades. They don't want you to, to put them in a spotlight. They don't want you to do any of those things. They just want you to remember the sacrifices that they've made. When, when you're, and, and Pastor Brad and I have this conversation every year on Memorial Day and Labor Day and, and every holiday that honors the veterans, you know, I want you to go out and, and grill burgers and have a good time, and I want you to celebrate, and I want you to enjoy your days off, and I want you to enjoy the freedom in this country that you've been given because of people who have gone to foreign soil and laid down their life, and even here on Connors here in the United States, to protect our borders and do what they do. But remember... The freedom that you had to come in this place and worship the God that we worship is because somebody made a sacrifice for you. And when you're grilling burgers and praising the Lord and doing all that you're doing, somewhere in this country there's a mama and a wife and a daughter and a son and a grandfather and all those things that have lost somebody so you can do what you're allowed to do. And that's come and worship God. Let me say this, and then I'll, I'll give the microphone up. Um, we search for answers. We, we think, oh, is it training? Is it education? Is it, you know, is it, and those are the things that are very important. But as Pastor Brad says, and in, in what we'll say as a body of Christ from the day until we leave this earth and actually go to heaven, is that the answer is Jesus, period. Amen. You know what I mean? That, that is the bottom line, final answer is Jesus Christ. And in that unconditional love that comes with that, I'm going to be completely transparent with you. Five years ago, ten years ago, before I had an encounter with Jesus Christ, I hated people. And I didn't hate you because of your skin color. I didn't hate you because of your, your ethnic background. I didn't hate you because of your, your social status. I just, because of the empowerment of the enemy that hardened my heart, I hated people, period. And I didn't care. You could be as nice to me, as sweet as you be, but in the end, there was a darkness that had overcome my heart that allowed me to hate people, period. Uh, I didn't want to be in your presence. I didn't want to interact with you. I didn't want to do all those things. But when I had my interaction with Jesus Christ, he took all that away from me. And the reason I get so emotional and the way, reason I get so sissified or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> it's because I know the love of Jesus Christ and I know what it did in my life. And now I don't care. I don't care. I don't care if you're white, black, purple, green, yellow. I don't care what bathroom you use. I don't care if you stand up. I don't care if you sit down. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how poor you are. I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you love. I know that in your heart, if you accept Jesus Christ, immediately you become a child of God, and that's it. That's final, period. And I love you, and I will lay down my life just like everybody in here I feel like will because we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I don't, it, and the rest doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. You're my brother, you're my sister, and I love you just like God loves you with an unconditional love that I will never be able to explain. Amen? Amen. Well, y'all just put your hands together for our panel.
Now, yeah, y'all, you can you can go find a seat if you want to. Um, what I want to do, I know I know what time it is. Don't worry. Don't look at your watch. We're gonna get out of here. I just want to share something with you because I need you to understand something. This was not to glorify struggles or problems. All right, this was to offer you perspective of people that walk in shoes that are different than yours. So that maybe you'll go up to somebody when something like this week happens, you'll go and put your arm around somebody like Jamel or somebody like Aaron and say, I just want you to know that I love you and care for you. Because they need to hear that. The people that need to be speaking up are not the people that are being victimized. They're, it's the rest of us that need to speak up. So that we can say, you know what, we stand with you and we love you and I don't know what you're going through and I don't know what you're feeling right now, but I just want you to know that you're loved and you're cared for. That's what family does. And that's what the body of Christ needs to do. I want to share with you, you give me about 12 minutes and we'll be out of here. But I want to share with you now because we, well, I don't want to glorify problems. We came to talk about them, to give a perspective, but now to look at the solution. And for that, we're going to go to the word of God. Paul teaches us, Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I need to say that again so I can get more than one that's right. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, rulers of darkness of this age, spiritual host of wickedness in spiritual places. It's important for Paul, for you to understand who Paul's talking about when he says, for we. He's talking about born again believers. He is writing to the church of Ephesus for people who have accepted Jesus Christ. And he says, for we, for those who are believers in Jesus, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Okay, so I know you've heard that statement a thousand times. You've read this scripture, but I need you to hear this. That means if you are a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you have forfeited the right to consider anyone that is made up of flesh and blood your enemy. Do you understand the significance of that? If you are a child of God, Paul says, if you are, for we, believers in Jesus, wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. That's flesh of any color. That any blood. I don't care what your blood type is. I don't care what your skin color is. If you are a born again believer in Christ Jesus, your enemy is not a person. If you are a young black male, your enemy is not the law enforcement. Do you hear me? If you are of any skin color, your enemy is not someone else with skin. It's against the spirit. Race it, the racism, the racial tension that's going on is a fruit of a spiritual battle that is taking place in the unseen. That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, guys, what you see is not the real battle. That's, that, that is just, that's an acting out of what's going on in the spirit. And you don't change the behavior to fix the problem. You go to the root. And Paul says, so we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against evil spirits. But that's not all, because in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, Paul says this, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge this, that if one died for all, all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for Christ who died for them and rose again. Now listen to how we're supposed to see each other. I've already showed you how you can't consider flesh and blood your enemy, but listen to what Paul says. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. So that means when I look, I don't look at flesh to determine you're an enemy. I can't because my enemies are not of flesh and blood. But I also don't look at you in the flesh to determine if you're my ally. Because I don't regard you by the flesh. So what Paul says is when you are a born again believer, you have forfeited your right to make someone your enemy and you have forfeited your right to judge the people around you according to how they look. Now this is your choice. You have a choice whether or not you're a born again believer. But if you consider yourself a born again believer, you have forfeited the right to determine that I don't have to love someone that looks different than me. Yeah, you don't want to amen. You, some of y'all amen and 
But some of y'all are thinking to yourself, oh my goodness. But that's, that's what Paul says. So we can't regard our enemies according to flesh, and I can't regard my allies according to flesh. Regard them by the spirit. Newsflash, your spirit has no color. You don't have white spirits and black spirits and Hispanic spirits and purple. You have one spirit, the Holy Spirit. I regard you not by your flesh, but by your spirit. So that means you're no longer, I don't walk up and say, hey, how you doing, black spirit? Hey, how you doing, white spirit? I regard you by the spirit, and your spirit has no color. And don't give me auras in that new age mess. You, your spirit does not have a color. Somebody say amen. amen. And I regard no one by the flesh, but only by the spirit. That word regard there is oidamin. It means to know, or listen to this, treat accordingly. Now, I need you to hear this, because this is what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can't see color. See, I, I think sometimes we, 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 wanna, we, we, we say things that sound good and with good intention we mean them, but we say things like, I don't see color. Well, if you don't see color, it's only because you're colorblind. And, and, and the object is not to become colorblind. The object is not for me to see you as something that you're not. The object, he doesn't say see them according to their spirit. He says regard them, treat them. So I need you to catch this. It's okay for you to see color. It's not okay for you to treat someone according to their color. And I need to set this straight because some people in the body, see, you, and, and here's why you need to know this because some of you are frustrated because you're trying your best not to see color, but you're seeing color. It's okay to see color. There is, listen, we, we're actually, it's actually a prejudice act when I try not to see your color. Because what I'm saying is if I see Warren as a black man, that's some kind of insult. That's not an insult because it's not an insult to be a black man. It's an insult if I treat you different because you're a black man. I am preaching up in here. It's, it's, I'm not supposed to see Omar and say, oh, he, he's, not, he's not Hispanic. That, well, yeah, that's a lie. That's stupid. That's, that doesn't make any sense. What's different is when I stereotype him, I treat him according to the color of his skin. Paul says, do not treat anyone different because of their skin, because that's what we treat people according to their spirit, not of their flesh. Am I helping anybody? We're gonna get out of here, hang on, hang on. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you why that's important. The answer to the dilemma that society faces is the kingdom. The kingdom is the government that Jesus established. If society reflected the kingdom, we wouldn't have the issues we have. So the answer is the kingdom. But let me tell you why it's important that we regard, we, we understand our enemies are not made of flesh and blood. We don't see our allies as flesh and blood. We don't even see ourselves according to the flesh. Listen why. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So you cannot operate in the kingdom if you still regard those by the flesh. I must be in the spirit to operate in the kingdom. That means I've got to be led by the spirit. That means I've got to operate in the spirit. That means I've got to see you in the spirit. Because flesh and blood does not operate in the kingdom. So if you're operating according to what you see with your natural eyes, you're not operating according to the kingdom. And I know, I understand. Black lives matter, blue lives matter, white lives matter, all lives matter. Black pride, white pride, American pride, it's all pride. It's all pride. And it's okay to be proud of our roots, but the moment you begin to esteem value, 
I'm, I'm, I'm gonna speak. You ain't got to amen. You can get up and leave if you want to, but I'm gonna say this. It's not okay for me to make my decisions and treat you according to my heritage. It's not okay for me to think because your skin color is darker than mine that you're of lesser value. Because people who used to look like me and used to treat people who used to look like you in a different way. I can't see you of lesser value because of what somebody did that I ain't never even met. Now, now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. In the same token, if you treat me different because of the stories you read that are true about the way people like me treated people like you, then you're also operating according to the flesh, not of the kingdom. And what I'm doing is I'm saying if I'm going to abide by the kingdom, I've got to forfeit my right to treat you according to how you look. The kingdom is the answer. When we begin to have the kingdom established and in operation, it will oppose the world system. You see, you need to understand something. The fight is not about equality. It's not. Now, I'm all for fighting for equal rights. All for it. 100%. Everybody needs to be treated the same. I think I'm making myself plain and clear when I say, say that. But that's not the battle that's being portrayed. What's being portrayed is pick a side. It's pick a side. I had a conversation with two pastors. I'm, I'm going to share this and then we're going to prophesy and we're going to the house. But I had two pastors talking. And we're having, having a conversation this week. And one of them is arguing. Both of them were African American. No, no, no. Both of them were black. I'm tired of, I'm tired of being politically correct. Uh, y'all call me white. I call you black. And y'all know my heart and I love y'all. And if that offends you, tell me and I'll be respectful to you. But let's just, let, let's just talk. All right. And I know that's not your color. That's just how you recognize in society. It ain't nothing. If, you, if that offends you, put on some makeup. Hallelujah. Anyway. Listen, both of, both of these guys are black. One of them was one of them got mad and said, it's offensive to me when I post a, a message talking about all blacks matter, all black, well, what's it called? black lives matter, and then someone else posts one that says all lives matter. And the other guy said, well, that doesn't make any sense because you're upset when people say all lives matter when you're saying black lives matter and black lives are a part of all lives. And I interjected as the white guy. <laughs> Third party. Here's what I said. I said, hey, guys. I said, listen, both of you are right. Because what happens is when someone who is upset sees a post about Black Lives Matter, they respond with All Lives Matter as a rebuttal to Black Lives Matter. And that's wrong. I'm sorry. That's wrong. All lives do matter. And I don't think anybody's arguing that they don't. And, and the guy, here's just what the guy argued on, on the Black Lives Matter said. He said, well, think of it like this. Think about if you went to the doctor's office with a broken arm. And you said, I have a broken arm. And the guy said, well, I can't fix it because all, all the other bones are fine. All bones matter, not just the, the broken bone. And I said, man, that's a good point. And then there's, listen to what the other guy said. The other guy said, oh, yeah, but uh, that, that would work if all the other bones weren't broken. He said, so when you say, when you make that statement, what you're saying is that black lives are the only lives that are, that are being attacked. He said, so that, that, that analogy works if all the other ones are functioning properly. He said, but Christians' lives matter and they're being persecuted. Jews matter, they're being persecuted. Lord knows the Hispanic population is being, they're being, they're being, uh, they're being hurt, they're being, they matter. He said, uh, blue lives matter. And see, he said, see, all these people are hurting. So, and, and I said, you know what, y'all both right. I don't know how that works, but y'all both right. Here's the problem. It's all about heart, though. If you get mad when somebody says black lives matter, then you need to ask yourself, why am I mad? Now, if they, if they look at you, and I've, never, I've not heard anybody say this, and they may be, because we got some jacked up, crazy folk out there on social media and on TV and everywhere else. So I'm not saying they ain't saying it, but if somebody looks at you and says black lives matter, no other lives matter, then, then you can get upset. If somebody looks at you and say all lives matter except black lives matter, then you can get upset. But if, you, if they don't say those things, quit getting upset over something that they're not saying. Am I helping anybody? Because we, 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 we are the most easily offended people I've ever seen in my life. And, 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 and the last thing I want to say, and then we're going to process this. You are not deciding. Okay, this week it's been portrayed. Here's what, here's what a, there was a line drawn in the sand. And I'm going to be honest with you. By media which is being run by the enemy. 
And here's the line. And they said, all right, pick a side. Black, law enforcement. And we have almost felt pushed to pick a side. And the thing is, is most of the people that we are trying to pick a side for, these people over here don't have angst with these people over here. Are there some? Yeah. And they're the ones that we always highlight, and they're the ones that the news interviews. You notice the news people don't ever interview somebody that's got any sense? And I tell you, I was out here, and these people started shooting at me crazy. But that's what these people get. You see on both sides. I mean, they, they interview the hooligans. Why? Because they're trying to promote division. That, I mean, that's the truth. It's, you, we're not picking sides. We're not, the moment we're trying to, that our motivation becomes who's right and who's wrong is the, mo, is, the, is the moment we're out of order. You know what Jesus said? He said, love them. Love them. Love them all. Love them. What if they don't love us? What if they, what if they start shooting? What if they do? Love them. Now, you ain't got to sit there and hold hands with them while they're shooting you. But you got to love them. Well, I don't want to love them. They're against me. They don't believe in God. They don't believe, I don't care. He didn't say, love those who believe in me. He didn't say, love those who are like you. He didn't say, love those who are exactly like you. He said, love. Love one another. You know why? Because love always wins. Now, let me tell you why this is important. We're going home. Good Lord, we're going home. Hallelujah. Black church matters. That's why we're staying late. Praise God. All you white people ain't never been to black church. You ain't going to get that. But just ask somebody. Listen. Listen. No, we ain't. We ain't going to be here at 2 o'clock. Black church don't matter that much. We're getting ready to get out. Listen. This is the word God gave me. Though. This is why, church, this is why it's important. And I'm going to tell you something. You may not be a part of this ministry, and that's okay. And, and, and you can tune out at this point. But I need to speak to the people who are called to this ministry specifically because this is the word for this house. Because this is what God showed me. In Genesis 37, 3, we're reading the story of Jacob and his sons. And he talks about his favorite son named Joseph. And in verse 3, it says that, that Jacob loved Joseph more than all his other folks. He showed them more love, okay? Now, you can fight about that's wrong, bad parenting or whatever, but that's what the word says. And he says, he, he favored him, he loved him more than others. So much so that he gave him something. He gave him a coat. The Bible says a tunic of many colors. Okay? And the Lord brought that to my attention. And, and, and so I went to the scripture and I started reading it. And this is what God said. God said, you know, what, 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 what upset all the other brothers and what, what created the stir was not the fact that jo Joseph's dad, Jacob, gave him a coat. It was that, because he could have given all the sons a coat, as far as we know. But it said he gave him a coat of many colors because he was the favored one. And if you read the story of Joseph, even when he was in the, the pit and then he went to you know, Potiphar's house and he ended up in prison, the palace, every, every, every step of the way it always says, but the spirit of the Lord was upon him for he had the favor of God. See, the coat of many colors represented the favor of God. What made it unique was that it consisted of many colors. Oh, you missed it, 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 you missed it. You missed it. Okay, okay, step back in and remember what we're talking about here today. It was a coat of many colors, various colors. The word there is, is pasim, right? Which actually means uh, it, various colors, a tunic of various colors. So I thought about that thing. Thought about it some more, and I thought about it some more, and I said, God, man, that's good. That, that'll preach. I can say that. Everybody going to shout, because we are, because God spoke this. God said, you are a coat of many colors. I need you, to, I'm talking about kingdom builders. Kingdom builders is a coat of many colors. And when you show up, the favor of God shows up. You are a representation of the favor of God in the earth because we are not just a covering, we are a covering that consists of many colors. And I don't just mean skin color, I'm talking about diversity, age, I'm talking about everything, okay? But after I thought about it, I, I actually, I said, I want to know what that word is for that, that tunic, that coat of many colors. So, so I did, and, and that's why I saw it's Pasim. But when I, when I went to my research, it actually showed up another place in Scripture. And I said, God, I don't ever remember anywhere else in Scripture talking about a robe of many colors. But it showed up in Samuel. And there's a story in Samuel about a young lady named Tamar. 
And Tamar was the daughter of David, the king. And the story of Tamar is a sad story because what happens is, says Tamar was a beautiful young lady, but she had someone that was deeply in love with her. The problem was that this was a Jerry Springer made for TV romance because the person that was in love with her was her brother, Amnon. And the Bible says that Amnon loved her so much that he got physically sick because he couldn't be with her. So then Amnon, he devised a scheme that ended up getting, uh, David ended up sending Tamar to Amnon's room because to, to, he was sick in the bed to feed him. And when she went in there, Amnon, her brother, her half-brother raped her. And I've heard that story, I've preached that story, I've read that story, but I need you to catch this right here. In verse 18 of 2 Samuel chapter 13, after she gets raped, listen to what it says. Now she had on a robe of many colors. For the king's virgins, virgin daughters wore this apparel. So I said, man, God, I, I, I don't know how many times I've read the story of Tamar. I've never even, never even read that. So I, I looked, and that's that same word about Passim. I said, well, God, what are, you, what are you trying to show us here? And he said this, he said, the king's virgin daughters wore this. It was a sign of royalty. The prophecy over Joseph was that he would end up in the palace. He would end up in royalty. So when his brothers saw the coat of many colors, they were upset because not only did he wear royalty, but he actually told them he had a dream where everyone was gonna bow to him. See, we don't even realize Jacob was actually doing a prophetic declaration by giving him a coat of many colors. But I need you to catch this because this is what happens to Tamar. Verse 19 says, Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her, laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. The enemy came in and defiled her. And then she tore her coat of many colors. I need you to catch this. The enemy came in and defiled her. And because of what the enemy did, the coat of many colors got ripped. The colors got separated. The reason the enemy is defiling the church is because he's trying to rip apart the colors. Why? Because the colors collectively represent the favor of God. So if I can remove the colors, I can remove the favor. If I can separate the colors, my God, I am preaching. If I can separate the colors, then the favor of the Lord is lifted. Listen to what happens to Tamar. Listen, listen, listen. This is why I'm going to close. Stand up, stand your feet, stand your feet, stand your feet. Listen to why. Listen to why that's important. Because in verse 20, in verse 20 of Tamar's story, the Bible says that after she tore the robe, after she'd been defiled, the, fa the favor was lifted. She no longer could go in the palace. So she spent the rest of her, her the, the rest of the days of her life living desolate in Absalom's house. She lost the favor, so she lost access to the palace. The palace is the king's domain. <laughs> the palace is the king's domain. Let me say it slow for you. The palace is the king domain. The king domain. The king dumb. The enemy wants to destroy and separate the colors so that the favor will lift so we won't operate in the kingdom anymore. And if the church isn't careful, see, we've got the power. Greater is he that sent us than he that's in the world. Collectively, we have the power. But if we're not careful and we allow the enemy to separate the colors, separate the diversities, then we're going to lose the access that we have to operate in the kingdom. David said it best in the 
133rd Psalm, he said, where brethren dwell together in unity, there's a commanded blessing of God. Do you know the reason why I will not allow what's going on outside these four walls in our country today, this week, in this time, to destroy what we have worked so hard to see God build in this place? It's because we are going to operate under the favor of God, the commanded blessing of God. And we will not give place for the enemy to be able to separate the colors. The colors followed Joseph because he never let the enemy get to his heart. The enemy got to Tamar's heart. When she was defiled, she could not relinquish her shame to the point where she would be restored back. It wasn't her fault. Can I just tell you that? She didn't make a bad decision. She was a victim. When you become victimized, you have a choice. I need you to hear me. You have a choice when you're victimized. Do I walk away and say, well, that's it. It happened to me. I got profiled. I got abused. I got left out. I got judged. I got prejudiced against. So I, I'm out. I'm disqualified. Or do we hold faith like Joseph and say, you know what, God, I know what you showed me. You showed me a palace. You favored me. You promised me, but I'm in a pit. You showed me, you told me, but I'm in a prison. I'm forsaken, I'm forgotten. How can this be when you've shown me? But he held on to his faith. And even though he went up and down the roller coaster, he ended up in the palace exactly where God called him to be. So the more of the story is this, you can allow the attacks of the enemy to make you bitter, or you can allow them to make you better. And if we will set aside our differences, if we will recognize that our enemy is not in a person, and if we will regard each other by the Spirit, then we can operate in the kingdom and we can see the fullness of everything that God promised us come to pass. How about put your hands together and give God some praise. Can I just tell you, we're not trying to be colorblind. I'm not trying to see you as something you're not. I'm just going to receive you as who you are. I don't see a black man. I see a child of God. I don't see a white man. I see a child of God. I don't see a police officer. I see a child of God. That's how I regard you. And we will be, hear me loud and clear, people of God, and hear me loud and clear, devil. We will be that church. Yeah, we will be that church. We will be that church. We will be a peculiar people. We will be a chosen generation. We will be a royal priesthood. We are the body of Christ. Many colors, but all favor in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for blessing me with the opportunity to pastor the greatest people that I know on this planet. Lord, I thank you for the testimonies that were shared, for the transparency that was displayed, and for the vulnerability that was offered up today so that we could have our eyes opened up to the perspective of those that we love but that see the world differently than we do because they're sitting in a different place. Lord, soften our hearts and sensitize our minds and our emotions to be aware of the plight and struggles of those that are around us so that we may see the opportunities to bless them as you have blessed us. Lord, we stand united under the commanded blessing of you as brothers and sisters in Christ of all creed and color, making a statement to the world and making a declaration to hell that we are a blessed people 
and that the fullness of the kingdom that you paid for Jesus shall come to pass. And for that, we give you all the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. Amen, amen and amen.